Point of parliamentary procedure. Uh, let us commence. Uh, we are going to hear now from our first featured speaker, uh, Jana Reese. And uh, Jana is working on a book that is to be published by Oxford University Press that is going to be called The Next Mormons, right? Uh, which is going to be an important event in Mormon studies. Uh, going to be based on a representative sample uh, of Mormons. And I think she is going to... Um, talk about some of her uh, uh, data today. Uh, she is a uh, prominent uh, religion journalist, and uh, she has a PhD from Columbia. And uh, we'll turn the time over to Jen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking around. It's a, you know the end of the day, and I'm sure everyone is very tired. So I do appreciate it, and I will try to make this lively. When you are a Mormon kid, going to high school in a non-Mormon area is hard enough. You're in the minority, everywhere except at church. And there's always a good chance you'll have to defend your values to others who don't understand. That it can be difficult is true, even under the best of circumstances. But it wasn't the best of circumstances in 2008 in California, when Mikey, now 25, was attending high school. Rather, it was the height of the controversy over Proposition 8. This was terribly confusing for Mikey, because he was not exactly sure how he felt about Prop 8. He was sure how his parents and his church wanted him to feel. And in fact, his parents put a Pro 8 bumper sticker on his car without asking Mikey beforehand. This resulted in other students uh, putting graffiti on the car, things like bigot, and you hate faggots. Mikey was relieved that when the measure passed and there was so much anti-Mormon backlash, all of his friends who had opposed Prop 8 remained friends with him. But he knew that the issue of same-sex marriage not only was not resolved in the country, but was not resolved even in his own mind. In our interview, Mikey never directly stated that he felt the LDS Church was wrong about Prop 8, but it was also very clear to me that he was not a knee-jerk supporter. He had to be persuaded to adopt the Church's position. So during the Prop 8 controversy, he attended a broadcast in which LDS leaders were encouraging Church members to donate money to the measure and to give their time in order to canvas door-to-door and do phone booth calls. Mikey says that on the question of gay marriage, he was not able to form an opinion, but he listened to everything the leaders said, and he prayed about it. During the broadcast, he had a spiritual impression that he should support the initiative, not because it was how he felt himself, but because beloved church leaders were asking him to follow their counsel. In the end, Mikey backed the church's actions with Prop 8, because bowing to prophetic authority was part of how he demonstrated his loyalty to and his love for his religion. He says that he would probably follow the same course now, though he would have a hard time with it. I feel like it's very important to follow the prophet, even if you don't know the answer, he told me. He said, I need to, at the very least, have spiritual insight on what the prophet has to say. A lot of times it's that I disagree, but I follow. We're just a bunch of men and women who don't know the full picture and are trying to do the best with the information we are given. And then he says we update our belief system when there's new information, line upon line. Mikey's thoughtful ruminations about ecclesiastical authority get to the heart of my remarks today and also of the authority chapter of the next Mormons book. And if I look tired, it's because I just handed in the book on Friday uh, and it was big, <laughs> too big. Millennial Mormons have grown up in a religious tradition that places a premium on obeying the leaders of the church and they have inherited modern Mormonism's expanded view of the role of the prophet. On the other hand, they're also embedded within a generation that takes a pretty dim view of many traditional institutions and has tended to qualify claims to exclusive truth. So how are young Mormons reconciling these tensions within themselves? 
In what ways might they regard authority differently than older Mormons do? So that was one of many questions that I had in thinking about doing this national survey that Rick was talking about. And so since you are a real professional sociologist, I'm going to spend a minute on the methodology here. Uh, I am not a sociologist. Rick glossed over that in a very beautiful way. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I'm a historian, and uh, that's at least how I was trained. And so we don't poll dead people, at least not the way that I was trained to be a historian. Um, so a lot of this methodology is new to me. I'll get to, in a minute, all the help I had. But for cur current Mormons, we had 1,156 people in the sample. It was fielded by Qualtrics in September and October of 2016. Um, following standard protocols, international review board guidelines, panel matching technique, in order to achieve as representative a sample as we could. Um, 540 former Mormons, so a total of 1,696 people in the survey. So margin of error, roughly 3% for the current Mormon population, more than 4% for the former Mormon population. Um, this research was funded by donations. Several of the donors are here in this room. I just wrote out the acknowledgments of the book, which were 1,500 words long the longest acknowledgments I've ever done for any book because it contained almost all of the names of people who had supported this research on Kickstarter. So if that applies to you, would you raise your hand and just say, so I can say thank you, probably. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both very much. The book that's coming out of this, as Rick said, is called The Next Mormons, and it will be published, Lord willing and the Creek Don't Rise, in a year, so next March. All right, so I mentioned the help that I've had, and this is really important. Benjamin Knoll, who is a political scientist at Center College, would have liked to be here today so that we could present this together. Ben has been instrumental in this process from the very beginning, when he and I met to talk about a book that he wanted to do, which is being published soon from Oxford on women's ordination, and new data about American feelings toward women's ordination, not just Mormons. Um, so that's pretty cool and interesting. And so we decided we would trade favors where I would edit his book because that's how I make my living primarily as an editor. And uh, Ben would help me. I don't know that he had any idea like what he was getting into and how much time this has taken, but he believes it's as interesting as I have believed it is. So I think it's been fun for both of us. So we surveyed four generations of Mormons, um, just to give you a little bit of context, we only had 36 people in our little cohort of the silent generation, which isn't much. And I've joked before that particularly we were looking for men. I, it's never been a problem to have old men weighing in with Mormonism to give their opinions before, but it was a problem for us. So we've combined the responses of the silent generation with the baby boomers so that we can have a nice, robust cohort called the Boomer Silence, and then Gen Xers and Millennials, both of those generations had slightly more than 400 people. So you can see here the years that are given. You probably know that generational cutoffs are a little bit arbitrary, but we did ours so that they would be almost exactly the same as what Pew does, so that we would be able to meaningfully compare some of our data with Pew's. Also, something to know about the current Mormon sample, 86% of these respondents said that they were either somewhat or very active in the LDS church, with emphasis on the very. Most of the people were pretty gung-ho. 52% hold a current temple recommend. So pretty, pretty orthodox sample overall. All right. Thinking about five topics that I'm going to talk about with institutional authority, and then there will be two very quick topics at the end on what I'm calling relational authority. Number one, religious organizations are a force for good. Is that something that we can take for granted anymore? Two, obeying leaders is necessary to being a good Mormon. How do different generations feel about that question? 
Three, I am sometimes troubled by a culture of obedience and conformity. I'll explain that question when we get there. Uh, I've watched General Conference in the last six months, and then I would obey priesthood leaders or I would follow my own personal revelation if those came into conflict. So we're going to start out with this first one. Religious organizations are a force for good. So this is a topic that we have some comparative data we can use from Pew and from Gallup and many other studies that have been done longitudinally about eroding trust in institutions. So basically, from this particular Pew study, in 2010, 73% of millennials believed that churches and religious organizations have a positive effect on where the country is going in 2015. That was down to 55%. For this particular question, that's the most recent data I've seen. I would not be surprised if it's gone down a little bit more since then. Millennials in general tend to have a fading trust in a lot of different institutions. In fact, compared to some of these other ones, religion actually comes out pretty darn well. 55% is still a majority. Uh, they have very strong feelings about government. Congress is at the bottom of the list in terms of trust. There are some institutions, though, that are holding steadier, including labor unions, though, although there's a, an asterisk there because Gallup did not replicate that finding. But small businesses, universities, and even the military have positive reviews from millennials. So I think it's good that when we talk about the eroding trust of institutions, that it's not monolithic and that we, we think about it in a more nuanced way. All right, so where are Mormons in this? Religious organizations are a great force for good. Mormon millennials are positive about religious organizations compared to other millennials, but they're not as positive about them compared to older Mormons. And that's pretty much the theme of my entire book, that these <laughs> Mormon millennials who are still identified with the religious tradition are a hybrid of the values of their generation and then the values of older Mormons, and they're in the middle, which is a difficult place in many cases for them to be, especially politically. So here we see from the small cohort of silent generation people that we have, this is one of the one of the few where the silent generation is treated separately, because I think that 92% is really cute. That 92% uh, think religious organizations are a great force for good. But down to 62% of millennials, again, that's higher than it is for the general population of millennials, but it's lower than it is for older Mormons. There are some other indications in the survey, I don't have a slide for this one, that millennials are less vigorous in their embrace of LDS institutional authority, but this is not a group that wants to come out and in any way oppose the prophet. This is not a rejection of authority, but sometimes they come across as being less enthusiastic. For example, our survey had a question in which uh, people were given nine randomized items that could be their favorite part of being Mormon, and they were asked to choose three of those things. And for Boomer Silence, having a prophet on the earth today ranked number four. So that came out pretty well. Um, but for both Generation X and the Millennials, it was seventh. So that's a softer kind of signal, but it is still there. Another thing we can look at is this question of what is required to be a good Mormon. So here, Millennials were a little bit less likely than older Mormons to say that obeying, obeying leaders was essential to being a good Mormon. So 70% of the Boomer Silent combined cohort says that obeying leaders is essential to a Mormon identity. 59% of millennials say the same. So it's still a majority of millennials who believe that obeying leaders is vital to a Mormon identity, but it is a slightly slimmer majority than we see with the older generation. Here's a stronger area of difference in this question. Whether Mormons are troubled by the church's culture of conformity and obedience. So this came in a series of questions about various things that Mormons might find troubling. 
such as uh, race and the priesthood temple ban or Joseph Smith practicing polygamy, Joseph Smith practicing polyandry. So that's the context of this question. And people were asked to say whether they found it very troubling, a little troubling, or not at all troubling, one of which was the church's emphasis on conformity and obedience. As you can see here, seven in 10, boomer silence, they're not bothered by this. Conformity, sign me up, right? But 44% of millennials feel the same, which means that a majority of Mormon millennials, and I would also point out Gen Xers as well, are at least a little bit troubled, they say, by this culture of conformity and obedience. Um, it's impossible to tell from that question whether it's the conformity part that they are objecting to or the obedience part. So this may seem a trivial example, but I have been very struck by uh, wedding attire in the recent weddings that I've attended. And I've noticed that it's getting rarer in these weddings that I've gone to for the bride's attendants to all be wearing the same dress, which darn it, we had to do in my day, right? Everybody did that. So I looked it up and wouldn't you know, first of all, that there is, there's a whole industry of demographers who are working on wedding data crunching uh, and have analyzed this question. And apparently 66% of brides now say that they allow their attendants to wear the dresses of their choosing within a color uh, palette that they prescribe. So basically two thirds of weddings are more like this, where you see they're clearly all part of the wedding party, but everyone has their individual stamp on that dress. There's a little bit of variation. Uh, no one has to wear seafoam green if it doesn't you know, flatter them like it flatters anybody. But my point here is that in many ways, from customized music playlists to the constant refrain that they have heard from childhood that they are special, this is a generation that is well attuned to individualism. So with this question on conformity and obedience, we really don't know how much of this is them questioning or even rejecting obedience and how much of it is actually about conformity. I would suspect it's a mixture of both. So another area is how many Mormons are watching General Conference and how does that compare generationally? Uh, as you can see here, there's a pretty big drop between the silent generation and the millennials on the question of General Conference. And what's particularly interesting about this question to me is that the way the question was worded in uh, a, a whole series of possible things that popular culture items they might have consumed in the last six months, it just basically gives them the option, have you seen any of General Conference? So we're not saying, have you sat through all 10 hours of General Conference, right? Just have you seen General Conference and letting them decide what that means for themselves. And most millennials are not watching General Conference. They have not seen it in the last six months. There were only two pop culture categories in which millennials uh, did not exceed the pop culture consumption of their elders, and they were both about religion. So they're watching more HBO, they're watching more R-rated movies, they're watching more Disney movies, all of these categories, but they're not watching General Conference as much, and they're not watching LDS church videos on the LDS website. And those were the only two categories where millennials did not come out on top. In the book, I talk about a lot of reasons why this may be the case. I'm going to kind of skip that, these possible explanations, but if you want to talk about that at the end, we certainly can. I would say that as sociologists, you all know that there is a strong impetus to put forward our best religious behavior when other people are watching us, which is no longer the case with most people and general conference. So that's kind of an interesting development. It does not explain though why young people in particular seem less likely to watch general conference. So we can talk about possible reasons why that may be the case. All right, so generational difference is also evident on a question about obedience to priesthood leaders. 
Mormon respondents were presented with two statements and asked which one came closest to their view. Good Latter-day Saints should obey the Council of Priesthood Leaders, even if they don't necessarily know or understand why. And good Latter-day Saints should first seek their own personal revelation on a matter and act accordingly, even if it is in conflict with the Council of Priesthood Leaders. So, Ryan, does this sound familiar at all to you? (laughs) This was adapted from a question on one of Ryan's surveys. Uh, What we did, though, in order to kind of force the issue of authority to get respondents to... um, we, We wanted to know how far people would go. So we added this line here, even if it is in the con- in conflict with the Council of Priesthood Leaders. So to find out what they would do if that put them at odds with their church leaders. So as a whole, Mormons selected the first option. A majority of 56% say they would choose obedience to church leaders. I actually thought that would be higher. I was a little surprised that it was as low as it was, the remaining 44% would act on their personal revelation. And when Ben ran the multivariate regression analysis, the same kinds of trends that we were seeing on other measures came through. The ones who were most likely to obey church leaders tended to be women, political conservatives, people in Utah and those with a college degree, and other groups such as men, political liberals, non-Utah Mormons, and those with only a high school education leaned more toward personal revelation. And generational difference was also evident. So combining boomer silence, two-thirds of them said that they would obey priesthood leaders, even if they didn't know why. But barely half of millennials would, so 51%. This is still a majority. So remember the story of Mikey, right? Mikey from the beginning, who decided that he was going to go ahead and support the church's position on Prop 8 because following the prophet was an important value to him. Half of millennial Mormons feel that way. Half of them say that they would privilege their personal revelation, even if it came into conflict with church leaders. Having studied to be a pastor before I became a Mormon and went astray from my chosen career path, um, I've kept up a little bit with the literature on organizational behavior in churches. And it struck me when I saw this how ideal and beautiful that is to have this generation be so split so evenly between these two different models of authority is actually pretty darn great. Um, you need both kinds in a healthy church. You need both kinds of people, people who are willing to question leadership and people who are just willing to suck it up and do whatever needs to be done without question. And having a balance of those perspectives often means that both perspectives are respected equally in an ideal scenario. Where you have imbalance, you also often have a lack of respect for the minority position. That's my little sermon of the day. So we've seen on five different measures that millennial Mormons score lower than older ones in matters of institutional authority. Sometimes these are very modest divergences, like the 11 point difference that we saw between the 70% of boomer silence who say obeying church leaders is essential to being a good Mormon versus 59% of millennials, that's not huge. But sometimes it's more dramatic, like a 25 point drop in the percentage who say they are not troubled by the church's emphasis on obedience and conformity, or a 34 point drop in terms of viewing general conference. These various data points seem to signal something important. Millennial Mormons hold institutional authority more lightly than their elders in the LDS church have done. It's not a massive or dramatic change, but it is measurable. That's not to say that millennials differ in every single way. We also had a question about strength and confidence that their leaders would project or vulnerability and authenticity. And I really thought millennials were going to go for the vulnerability and authenticity. You know, this is a generation that has grown up listening to Brene Brown, who's wonderful, you know. Uh, But it was almost even. Six in 10 Mormons of just every generation across the board want strength and confidence projected from their leaders. Four in 10 said they preferred authenticity and vulnerability. 
All right, in the interest of time, I've chosen only two of these relational authority ideas. One is uh, millennials placing an emphasis on their relationship with their local bishops. And the second is self-reported, admittedly, stat statistics for home and visiting teaching. One thing that surprised me most from the data was the relationship that many millennials seem to have with their local bishop. The NMS asked respondents how often they seek counsel from their local bishop or branch president when making major decisions or experiencing significant problems. I was wondering whether boomer silent Mormons with their higher overall regard for authority would be more likely to consult with their local leaders in such situations, and I was completely wrong. That was not at all the case. Fewer than one in 10 boomer silent Mormons consult their bishop very often compared to nearly a quarter of millennials looked at from the other side, as you see in this slide. More than half of boomer silent Mormons rarely or never seek counsel from the bishop, a situation that applies to fewer than a third of millennials. In part, millennials' apparent eagerness to receive counsel from the bishop is due to where they are in the life cycle. They are young, they need advice, and specifically in the LDS contexts, Many of them are seeking endorsements for missionary service, acceptance at a church-owned university, or entrance to the temple. Um, all of those are milestones that require an ecclesiastical endorsement. But I would point out that the question did specifically mention, quote, when making major decisions or experiencing significant problems, unquote. That would suggest an element of personal trust, not just a situation in which a young adult would need a bishop to sign off on a letter of recommendation. What's more, um, I mentioned, I think, that I did 63 interviews. Did I say that? Anyway, oral history interviews with people like Mikey. Most of these interviews were about 90 minutes in length. Some of them stretched to be two hours. And it kept coming up again and again, relationships that people had with their bishops. One young man told me of a bishop, I'm sorry, a young woman in this case, who out of his own pocket supplemented the young women's activities so their budget would be the equivalent of the boys and he encouraged all of the girls in the ward to go on missions. I heard of YSA bishops who regularly opened their homes to students and other millennials, welcoming them for meals and fellowship, and of young adults who confessed difficult truths about themselves to bishops and received compassion in return. There were some negative stories, but I was surprised by how few there were, especially, I think, in the social media context that, that we've heard about, a lot of those negative stories get a lot of play on social media. But that was not first in for, for, forefront of the minds of many of these millennials, including many who had left the church. They were cognizant of the tremendous amount of time that bishops spend on church work for no pay. Several mentioned that they had won bishop roulette, indicating that they felt lucky in the hierarchical system that is Mormon leadership to have been assigned bishops who loved and understood them. In fact, the sentiment of Bishop Roulette came up often enough that it was rarer to find interviewees who didn't feel that they had ever gotten lucky than those who did feel that they had never gotten lucky. No, no double negatives, that's bad. But the point is, I was surprised by this data and a couple of other things that came through about how millennials feel about grassroots Mormonism. Home and visiting teaching, <sighs> this is a little bit out of context because in the chapter that tracks religious behavior that this is part of, uh, we see a drop in many cases, double digit drop in how millennials are holding up some of the behavioral standards of the church. Not all, but some of them, uh, for example, the word of wisdom, is not being as meticulously kept by this generation as it has by older Mormons. And in that context, where on many other behavioral standards we are seeing a drop, it is interesting that home and visiting teaching, millennials are right up there and a little bit ahead of older Mormons. I was surprised by this also because the dynamic of a younger person going to visit an older person is a power dynamic that might make that situation awkward. But apparently, millennials, at least by their own reportage, are doing really well with home and visiting teaching. In Protestant research, there's a lot of hand-wringing right now about young adults leaving 
religion. And in Mormonism, we are just now starting to wring the hands and raise the alarms because we have good reason to be worried too. Perhaps one thing to think about is that as we're looking at institutional authority as something that is not going to be the default way in to help this generation, uh, relational authority does seem to be something that they resonate with. <clears throat> Some Protestants have written about the moving away from the, quote, church as business model and into the church as relational community model. Home and visiting teaching already does that. So yay, Mormons, right? We have a program that already is about church as relational community. And by their own reporting, again, it does seem to be working. All right, the NMS data does not show that LDS millennials are in any way hostile to the church's institutional authority, but they do seem less keenly wedded to it, I would say, than older Mormons are. In the abstract, they're less likely to embrace the notion that obedience is essential to being a good Mormon, or that they should obey priesthood leaders if their own spiritual conscience is pulling them in a different direction. In practice, they are noticeably less likely to watch general conference, etc. But it's premature to say that these findings constitute a rejection of authority, so much as a redefinition of it. In the two ways I mentioned, and a few others as well, millennials do seem keenly interested in relational authority at the grassroots level. Perhaps that can be a way in for bishops and parents who are concerned about the rising tide of disaffiliation. Thank you.